Hi, how are you? Good to see you. We're going to talk today about the Colombian exchange. So, first of all, I need to tell you that the Colombian exchange is a phenomenon described uh, by, by a historian. We're going to talk a little bit uh, uh, later about him. Um, it's, he, write, he wrote this book in 1969, and he is going to go very deep into analyze what is this Colombian exchange and what is the trade that happened between Europe and America. Now, as I told you, uh, as I have been telling you, in the Colombian exchange, uh, people are saying that it was really bad. And actually, the historians think that it's really, really bad for uh, what happened when the two uh, different hemispheres of the world they collide and they form this brand new global economy uh, and ecosystem. I rather let me use that word when the when the new ecosystem is formed from the two hemisphere, it's going to bring consequences, and we're going to talk about those consequences in a little bit. Um, let's just hang with me for a couple of minutes. As you can see in this screen, we can see people that they don't like, like they wanted Christopher Columbus and abolish Columbus Day. And other people, they see that there's so much more benefit of the Colombian exchange. And one of these really good things that happened, pizza. <laughs> We couldn't have pizza if we if the Colombian exchange didn't happen. Just think about that. No pizza. No pizza whatsoever. Okay, so before the year 1492, um, before Christopher Columbus crossed the, uh, Easter, the Eastern Hemisphere, that means Europe, Asia, or Asia, and crossed the Atlantic Ocean to the Western Hemisphere, that means America, they were two very different ecosystems. These uh, ecosystems, they um, they developed it. They developed in bio in biological isolation. That means that they were isolated. They didn't have any contact, and this means that they were um, different sets of diseases, animals, plants, and people in one living in one side of the world and the other one living in the other side of the world. Um, first of all, let's go with the impressions. So uh, the differences, when Christopher Columbus arrived, uh, he said that all the trees were as different from ours as day from night. And so the fruit, the herbage, the rocks and all the things so Christopher Columbus recognizes that that was um, that it was happening. Uh, he arrived to a very different place where they didn't they didn't have the same things that he was used to. He's recognizing he's recognizing that there's a very different uh, environment or ecosystem surrounding him. Many of the Native Americans when they Spaniards uh, or the people from the Eastern Hemisphere arrived, they they didn't know what to make out of them. They thought they were gods, they're animals, they would never seen animals like that. And they just have never seen things like that. And it brought a lot of, um, it was a clash of these two civil civilizations and hemispheres. And uh, we might divide them the Colombian exchange in four parts, diseases, animals, plants, and people. So for the Native Americans, when they clashed with them, when they encountered themselves with the Eastern Hemisphere, it meant dead. And not only the dead that they was brought by the by the violence of the Spaniards, but also the death that the diseases carried. 
Okay, so two biological ecosystems inter uh, bio bio biological ecosystems merge to create a new world ecology. Uh, when Christopher, uh, Christopher Columbus brought these two hemispheres, that means two sides of the world, together, the contact between, uh, by crossing the Atlantic in 1492, he brought together those ecosystems. And in the years to come, they were going to interchange um, elements. And this uh, exchange of elements is going to have very deep consequences for humans and for plants, for animals, for pretty much the whole world felt that. The historian that I was talking about, his name is Alfred Crosby, and the book that he published was in 16, no, 1969, I'm sorry. And he's going to talk about the exchange between plants, animals, pathogens, that means diseases, and humans. And he said that the most spectacular thing that has ever happened to humans, and he doesn't use the spectacular way, uh, the, the spectacular term with a way of showing surprise or delight. It's, um, it brings a lot of death to the American people. So, exchange of diseases. Let's talk about diseases. So the first exchange is going to be of pathogens. We're going to talk about the diseases, the negative ones. So, on the negative, on the things that the Europeans brought to the New World, it was smallpox, mumps, measles, typhus, chickenpox, so I don't want to get very deep into the diseases and I don't want to gross you out with uh, gore details, but uh, smallpox, they look pretty horrible. They, um, it's almost uh, eliminated. There's no more smallpox in the, it's eradicated from, from the world. And I think it's very contagious uh, of, Often it changes the face and the it defigures the the person. Um, require medical di diagnosis, um, and it is critical. It needs emergency care. Another one is going to be measles, and you can see dry uh, fever, dry cough, run, runny nose. It's preventable. We have a vaccine for that. Then we have the mumps. Um, it's going to be very rare, but it's preventable by a vaccine. Then we're going to have chicken pox, that a highly contagious viral infection uh, causing an itchy, blister-like uh, rash. And it's preventable by vaccine, is usually self-treatable, but it spreads easily. Those, um, all, of, all of those, um, diseases are going to be part of what the Europeans brought to America. And the violence that the, that the Europeans brought to America kill a lot of people, but it, the, the people, the this disease killed around 90% of the population of the of the new world. They were not prepared to face anything like this. They were, the, the Native Americans, they were not prepared for these. They have never faced um, diseases like the ones that they, like the, the ones that the Europeans brought. This is smallpox. I know it looks awful. I don't want to gross you out with this. In Mexico alone, the native population fell from, they had around 30 million people in 1519, where Hernan Cortes started his expedition through Mexico. And by 1568, there were only 3 million left. So that means that, means that it took care 
around 90% of the population of the Native Americans. Pretty awful things. Now let's talk about the animals, the livestock. So the livestock were well, in America. They we didn't have we didn't have a lot of livestock. We didn't have a lot of animals that they could uh, bring the, that they help us. And the protein source in the in the Americans in the New World it was kind of short. Um, the animals that the, they brought the Europeans they were pigs, horses, cows. Just to give you an example. Um, when Hernando de Soto in 1539, he came to Florida, he brought with him 13 pigs. Um, when he died, he left 700 of those pigs. You may say, hey, Mr. Torres, but 700 pigs are not too much. Well, uh, Hernando de Soto, de Soto died in 1542. So, so in 1539, he had only 13 pigs. Three years later, those 13 pigs, they became 700 pigs. Pigs, they didn't have a lot of natural predators in, in America. So they were able to reproduce enormously. They were very success, successful at reproducing. The same thing happened with the horses and the sheep. Those animals, they were able to reproduce real fast. And this was a good thing for the Native Americans because they have a brand new source of protein. All those grasses that they were um, just being not very useful for the Native Americans, uh, Native Americans, they were able to produce uh protein i mean they eat uh, the cows and the pigs ate grass and the native americans the native americans were able to transform that grass into food for the piggies and the piggies they become bacon and who doesn't love bacon i mean it's bacon from grass to bacon what is not to love that's fantastic now let's continue um, the plague of sheep. So the numbers increased so rapidly that in fact, uh, there were some, there were some plants that they, ex they were extinct. Uh, the sheep also was a good source of protein and for clothing right now. So Native Americans themselves sometimes uh, face a problem of the sheep that they were destroying their gar gardens and they were eating out of their gardens, also pigs. So <sighs> they, for one side, the sheep, the pigs and the horses, they don't have predators and they're reproducing immensely. And on the other side, they're destroying plants that they were a source of food of the Native Americans. And they also are passing out diseases. Another thing that the Native Americans didn't have, those are chickens and eggs. Um, we didn't have, they didn't have them in here. So the Spanish uh, chronicler Antonio de Herrera tells uh, a story about a wise Indian who was asked, one of the most important things that um, the Europeans brought uh, from, um, from Spain to America. And this Native American says that in the first place, he put chicken eggs at the top of his list because they were plentiful air. You can have them every day fresh and you can cook them. And they're good cook, and sometimes even if they're not cooked, they're good for young and old people, and they're very easy to get. And the chickens are easy to take care of, and they reproduce very, very fast. So, a Native American thinks that Native Americans thinks that chicken and eggs are really good, good source of food, and probably one of the best things that Europeans brought. Now. 
let's continue with um, the horses. Horses were valued for many, many uh, group of uh, Native Americans. And actually they are, they become like staples for the Indians, for the cowboys, llaneros, gauchos, vaqueros. All of these start really appreciating the work that they, um, that the horses are doing because they are going to help explore all America and they're able to help uh, people carry heavy stuff. They're able to uh, help the, the people, the farmers. I mean, the horse, when it's introduced in America, is going to be one of the best animals to have around. Um, okay, and another of the great impacts of the Colombian exchange is, are going to be crops. And in this side, um, plants, the plants are going to start uh, from America, coming from America to Europe and from Europe to America. Let me give you a couple of examples. Um, okay, so in America, the potatoes are going to be a, are, are going to be a huge impact in Europe. Why? Because in Europe, uh, they're going to start cultivating potatoes. Actually, the Irish are going to thrive on uh, cultivating these potatoes. It is said that an Irish man was going to be able to eat even 10 pounds of potatoes every day. They are going to be uh, one of those crops that um, not very useful land um, in Europe. They're going to be able to start cultivating and getting a lot of food out of land that it was in another time not very useful. Corn. Uh, corn is not a staple of the European diet nowadays, and at that time even less, but it becomes one of the most important uh, crops to feed all the cattle in Europe. So corn, they feed it to their animals in Europe still. Uh, Manioc, sweet potatoes. Sweet potatoes are going to be staples in uh, Asia, in China, and in China, also in Asia, uh, in other parts of Asia, in Africa. Cocoa, chocolate, it's a staple food uh, in all Europe. Squash, chili peppers are going to be famous in India. Pumpkins in India, uh, papaya, guava, tobacco is going to be one of those crops that is going to is going to be is going to hurt the health of the Europeans. Still, avocados, pineapple, beans, peanuts, cottons, rubbers, and turkey. Those goes from America all the way to Europe, and Europe is going to give us sugar olive oil, various grains like wheat, rice, rye, barley, oats, grapes, coffee. Oh my God, imagine life without coffee. Coffee, they're, well, they're going to bring uh, horses, cattle, pigs, but those are not plants. Um, fruit, pears, apples, peaches, oranges, lemons, pomegranate, figs, bananas, chickpeas, melons, radishes, uh, weeds and grasses, cauliflower and cabbage. All of these are going to be part of the Colombian exchange. Probably in live classes, we're going to be able to have a more, um, we're going to talk a little bit more about that. So this is going to increase the food supply all over the world. And because when we are able to uh, eat properly, we reproduce. Humans are going to start to reproduce. Actually, from the 1650s all the way to the 18, 1815s, 
1850, the population of the world is going to double. Can you imagine that? So if in 1650 we were 30 million altogether in the world, by 1850 we're going to go double that. So we're going to be 60 million. So if we were 30, uh, 200 years after that, we're going to double. That's a lot, that's a lot of people, right? And I'm going to show your work, what you have to 